Okay then, thanks very much for attending today, guys, and welcome to Revolution Viewing's March webinar, where we'll be joined by, by Penny Eccles, and together we'll do our very best to help you fix the leaky hose pipe and maximise your student conversion. Okay, jump on to the next slide. So today's agenda, will I'll give you a quick brief in, uh, intro uh, to Revolution Viewing uh, and to Penny. Penny will deliver her leaky hose pipe session, uh, Jen will then run through uh, how you can address some of your website leaks uh, using our virtual experience platform, Veppel, um, as a guide. Uh, we'll then have some time for you to ask uh, some questions that you might have. Uh, I think a few of you are already familiar with the Q&A uh, section. Um, thanks very much for your comments already. Okay. And so I am Tom Greaves, and I'm the founder and CEO of Revolution Viewing. Uh, Jen, I'll hand over to you. Hi, I'm Jen. I'm the Client Services Director at Revolution Viewing, and I'll hand over to Penny. Hello, I'm Penny of Penny Eccles Limited, uh, and I'm a Marketing Student Recruitment Consultant. Cheers, guys. Okay, so a very brief overview of Revolution Viewing, uh, who we are and what we do. So we're a visual content and technology business founded in 2004. We are the most used provider of virtual open days, virtual tours, 360s and videos in UK higher education. And we've worked with 110 universities uh, over the years. Uh, we deliver online experiences, or we did deliver online experiences to over 2 million people interested in UK higher education in 2021. Um, we have carried out eight primary research studies over the past six years. Uh, we have a an advisory board or two advisory boards actually um, that uh, with a total of 27 universities advising us. Uh, and we launched Veppel, the virtual experience platform that Jen will touch on a little more later. And we launched that uh, a year ago. Okay. And our mission at Revolution Viewing is to empower people to make life-changing decisions. So for higher education, we're passionate at helping people uh, find their perfect university and we can only do that by partnering with you guys and so we're all passionate very passionate about higher education at revolution viewing so now i will pass you over to penny uh, revolution viewing uh, worked with penny uh, when penny was the director of marketing and communications at nottingham trent university and it's thanks to penny's innovative and strategic approach that we uh, enjoyed a great partnership working, working together to launch numerous uh, boundary pushing, pushing content and technology projects uh, aimed to increase conversion. Penny's wealth of experience working at a senior level at numerous universities over the past two decades means that she's perfectly placed to use her expertise to guide us all through some of the key points during the shortlisting process at which you may be losing some of your prospective students, often without knowing it. So I'll hand you over to Penny, who will help you to plug some of those leaks in your recruitment host pipe. Over to you, Penny. Thanks, Tom. Um, so yeah, um, so the Leaky Host Pipe Solution is a product I've been working on in collaboration with UCAS Media. Um, and it is a 28 point framework to look at where you might be losing students. Um, you might wonder where um, the term Leaky Host Pipe comes from. Uh, and I have a little story about that, uh, which is about my dad. Uh, he's passed away now, but he was my absolute hero. Quite an eccentric guy. And one of the things that he did, which used to irritate me so much, was that he was really tight. Um, he wouldn't buy anything new. Um, I remember for my 13th birthday, he bought me some talcum powder. Um, but, but he said it was because it was good for me to learn the value of money. Um, he was, you know, the ultimate eco warrior and he was, you know, one of those people who would always take his carrier bags to the shop, uh, even before it was a thing. Um, but one of the things that he did have, which uh, had lasted a long time, was his garden hose. Um, he had patched it up on so many occasions, you know, been to the garden shed so many times. Um, there was colourful strips of electrician's tape down there and um, puncture repair kits, you name it, he tried it on the hose pipe but actually whenever he would turn on the garden tap um, it would just be hilarious because there'd be sprinkles of water all the way down the hose pipe but when you looked at the end where crucially you needed that water there was very little coming out of the end 
And I've worked at seven universities now and even more universities uh, since I've been a consultant for the last two years. And it's just made me think now more than ever that we all operate our student recruitment like my dad's leaky hose pipe um, because we try so, so hard to generate as many inquiries as we possibly can um, that we just kind of lose them. So, you know, the student recruitment cycle has started in earnest. We have all of these inquiries. And at some points, we will really hemorrhage inquirers. So all of that hard work and all of the effort from the start is just gone. So not all of our inquirers turn into applicants. Massive leak. Uh, not all of our applicants are made offers. Another huge leak. Um, not all of our offers become firm. The you know the massive conversion problem that some of us experience. Another leak. And then what do we have to do? We have to pour that emergency glass of water on the problem, which is called clearing. And you know we we are spending as a sector an enormous amount of money on clearing, when in fact if we just were able to take the time to look at our hose pipe and really get to grips with where we were losing our students, we might save ourselves a lot of money um, in clearing. Uh, now, the great thing about this product, if I do say so myself, is that it's been supercharged uh, with UCAS data. So, you know, if you do work with me in UCAS, not only will you see how leaky you are, you'll be able to see how leaky you are in comparison with your competitor set because we never operate in a vacuum, do we? Um, and what it means is that, you know, I might look at leak 12 and we will decide together that, you know, leak 12 is an issue sector wide. It's particularly an issue for your competitors. So how much traction are you going to get on leak 12? But perhaps leak four, uh, there's something there. Your competitors are doing way better than you on leak four. And, and it's something that we can address. So um, I've been doing this for over a year now, and there are some things that have really jumped out at me, um, things that I think we could all learn from, um, which is why I've jumped at the chance when Tom asked me if I'd like to talk about this. Um, so I'm going to give you five killer insights, uh, which hopefully can uh, certainly help you for 2023 entry, but, you know, maybe some uh, last minute fixes to shore up your 2022 hose pipe. And the first one is for reassurance purposes, we're all leaky. Um, I have yet to come across an institution that has it all sorted. Um, so, you know, there's always going to be a good number of those 28 leaks uh, where you, you might be different and you are losing students. And there'll be some leaks where you're really, really doing well in, in, in comparison to the competitors. But I often say to clients that, you know, we're often trying to solve a problem that we haven't diagnosed. And sometimes we just need to take that thinking time as a team. Instead of running on this constant hamster wheel, I remember it so well. You're all working so, so hard to try and take a step back and think about what is the real problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, the second insight is that leaky doesn't actually mean bad news um, so you know some leaks are good and if i looked at a, a great leaky house pipe um, you know you've really done it if you've got a massive volume of inquiries uh, that they all turn or a good proportion of them turn into applications um, that you might have a heavy rejection rate but that only works if you have a high conversion rate as well so you know sometimes i do find that some institutions reject very heavily uh, in certain courses against their competitor set that doesn't um, but if you have a high conversion rate you can get away with a strong rejection rate um, those those Universities that are really in control of their hose pipe have a high confirmation threshold. So that means they've built up a good balloon of firm choices so that they are in control of the situation when it comes to confirmation. So they can decide where the quality line is and the hose pipe isn't in control of them. They are in control of the hose pipe. And then, of course, they do go into clearing because clearing can produce some great candidates but not overly reliant on clearing. So these are the things I think uh, are things to really watch. So number one, um, I've been looking at um, inquiry data sets and how many of those are leaked uh, 
um, but how many of those are retained to application stage. And it's been really quite different as to how many um, inquiries universities have been able to hold on to. It's been really different for every institution. But on average, 54% um, of applications were known to the institution uh, upon application. So that means that you know 54% of your inquiries you had a prior relationship with. And this won't surprise you that if you've had a prior relationship with somebody before they apply, they're much more likely to go the distance with you because they haven't just stuck you on their UCAS application. They've actually developed a bit of a connection with you. And, you know, when I think about the theme for the hosepipe, it really is about connections, what I like to call markers of care. Um, so how many markers of care have you had with an inquirer, applicant, firm choice candidate throughout that process? And, and the reason I really liked VEPL is um, it is a strong marker of care. Um, that you've been able to, you know, you're able to achieve that strong dwell time. That is not just somebody dropping on your website and dropping off again. Um, it's about making sure there's a relationship that's built. So uh, I challenge you to have a look at your data and see how many of last year's applicants did you already know at application stage? Because that is a really good indicator of your future success. And secondly, the inquirer data, um, how good is it? really. Um, so when we've been given data sets from institutions that have worked with, with us on the leaky hose pipe, um, for example, you know, they give us a data set and they say, yep, yeah, these are all the people that we got for 2020 entry. And when we've looked, we have found that only 54, 51% of those inquirers actually went anywhere. They actually went anywhere in 2020. Um, and that's been the average figure. So just imagine that, that only 51% of your inquirers are for that relevant year of entry. And you may be communicating to half of your inquirers right now about a year of entry that is of no interest to them. So you may be talking to them about clearing and actually it's next year that they're going to apply. And um, so, you know, one tip I would give you is go back to your inquirers and ask them, hey, you know when we met at a UCAS fair and you said you were coming in 2023, um, is that still the case? Um, because it's quite difficult to do the maths, isn't it, and to work out when you're going to join an institution. And it really matters because going back to markers of care, um, the students that will enrol with you are the ones that have received personalised communications and they've received a real dialogue with you. And you're not going to achieve a dialogue if you're constantly communicating with them about 2024, for example, when they're intending on coming in 2023. So really spend some time and have a good look at your inquiry data. Uh, the next one, um, I've, I've been kind of surprised by um, um, how mixed the data sets have been. Um, so, you know, some universities have been totally awesome at collecting online data and, and their forms online, uh, but less so at phone calls, for example. They just haven't captured phone calls at all. Um, often the outreach data that I receive um, is great and it shows a really positive conversion. But I often wonder, could you have captured more? Um, social media interactions, you know, I, I often think if somebody's going to put a message out there on your social media channels, um, they're really engaged with you and they're willing to socially put it out there that they're showing their allegiance to you. How good are you at, at taking that inquirer and putting them on your CRM system. Um, I think that's that's been the lowest amount of data sets that I've seen at any institution. And how do you handle interviews? You know, are you uh, capturing how many booked, how many attended? Are you giving them a happy goodbye, even if you reject them? Um, so, you know, spend some time thinking about how you're systematically going to collect this data. Um, it's really important because 
relationships only happen with dialogue and you can only get that dialogue if you know who they are I know it sounds a bit obvious um but unless you know who they are you can't have a dialogue and then you can't go to that ultimate place which is personalizing your communications and um, I mean it's the dream isn't it that one day we'll have a data set where we can identify those really hot leads the people that we think will definitely come to us and also that subset of students that we think are credible wins that we could probably win um, if we just were more personalized with them and and then you know use the tools and channel all of our resources and all of our efforts to be totally personalized with those leads and that's the dream and then finally, um, I know this is a bit old school, quoting Bruce Forsyth, but points really do mean prizes. Um, so for every hose pipe, it's been shown that the more touch points you have with an applicant, with an inquirer, the more likely they are to enrol. Um, seems so obvious. Um, but, you know, how often do we decide, right, we're going to have X number of touch points with our, our applicants and then really achieve it? And there was one university that I worked with and and they established for those students that they got seven touch points with. They had an 85 percent enrollment rate. I mean, that's the stuff we could only just dream of, isn't it, Rene? And so that university is aiming for that magic seven now, that magic seven. And I don't just mean email. We'll send them seven emails and the job is done. These are real markers of care. Um, so you know, how can you do that? And then finally, I know this is really a sixth point, but I liked five better than six, so 5A. Integrated teams are the ones that win. Um, you know, we always can do meetings as a team and call ourselves integrated, but what we're really doing is going around the room and saying, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, what is outreach doing? What are admissions doing? But um, I don't think we do enough of thinking, this is a problem, this is a leak, and how are we as an integrated team, all of us, going to focus on this one leak because this is where we'll make the biggest difference. And through working with universities on leaky hose pipes, it's really focused the mind on the things that will make the biggest difference rather than just constantly trying to fight fire, doing the next big thing. And um, sometimes we've just got to take some time and do what we're doing well even better. And I would I would say that you know our website is one of those crucial things. Um, we probably know there are gaps, there are leaks in our website, but so often they get pushed to one side. Maybe if we spend more time making it the best we can, we'll keep more people in that hose pipe. Uh, if you want to know more about the leaky hose pipe, please drop me a line or find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'd be delighted to talk to you, but uh, now over to you, Jen and Tom. Penny, thank you so much for that incredibly insightful presentation. Um, thank you also for the lovely segue towards the end into the website element, which sets me up beautifully for Jen's next piece. So Jen is now going to talk through in the second part of this session um, the online elements of your leaky host pipe. Um, gonna, Jen's going to try and help identify improve our prospective students. Uh, engage with your sites and we're going to use uh, some data from four university websites and we're going to pit that data hmm. against Bethel, our virtual experience platform. Let's see how we do. Okay, Jen, uh, over to you. Perfect. Thank you. So because I'm going to talk about Vepl a little bit to give some context to the examples that I give, I'm first off just going to give you a brief introduction to what, what is Vepl because you'll hear it quite a bit in the next kind of 10 minutes or so. So Vepl is our prospective student hub and it's packed with rich media content and that rich media content content could be things from 360s to videos to Q&A to chat integrations to maps to campus tours to all of that in one place and it's a personalized experience which I'll touch on in a second that is informed by the years of HA experience and research with prospective students that we've done as RV that Tom's touched upon that ultimately delivers the data to help you better understand and communicate with your prospective students. So we've got 14 clients on Vepl so far, 10 of whom are live. So those 10 
all contribute to the benchmark data, some of which I'll share today, again, just to give some context. So that's a little bit about Vepel. What I'm going to start with is a little bit of insight from students themselves. I'm going to play these two videos straight after each other. And what this gives is just a little bit of insight from Sophie, um, a student, and how important online is as part of that journey to find the perfect, perfect university for, for her. So I'm going to start with the first video. Give me one second. I looked at about 20 different universities when beginning my application um, to university and, and then whittled it down to about 10. Um, but when making that choice, I judged it a lot on what the website looked like. And if I couldn't find what I was looking for on the website, then that would change my opinion on a university. So I would just I'd instantly kind of forget about one or if they had more interactive stuff then I go to another. So I did base a lot of it on what I saw online. I'm just going to play Sophie's second video. I think we're a generation that are very used to doing things online and actually in terms of my experience with using virtual tours and online open days and things like that actually I got as much as I would have if not more um, than people who saw these things in person and I wasn't put off and I still go to university and um, it's been really useful for me throughout. So that's a little bit from Sophie. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to share a couple of stats that back that up. So Sophie's one person, but we've spoken to more students to understand what is the relationship between that online and that offline. And from that, 93% of prospective students said they'd be more likely to attend a physical open day having attended a virtual open day. So that just shows how the online and offline can work together due in that journey. So that's what they've said they'll do, but what do they actually do? What are the actual behaviours? So on the right hand side there, you can see that 9% figure and what that 9% is, of all Vepel users, 9% have clicked on a call to action to book onto an open day. So for simple maths, let's take a, a, a Vepel university, a Vepel client that is receiving 3000 visitors a month. That's around 300 visitors or 270 um, every single month who are clicking through to book onto a physical open day. So, again, just showing how important VEPL is, your website is in that journey through for students to find their perfect university. What I'm going to do now is show you some of the stats that Tom um, mentioned. So this is real data from real university websites obviously i can't tell you which universities um, but there's four universities that we've looked at and we've compared those stats to vepl and what you can see there is vepl in the green at the bottom so i'm going to look at bounce rate first so vepl has half the bounce rate of those the average of those four universities it has more than double the session duration, again, of those four university websites on average, and the pages per session is triple that of those four university websites. So really powerful. And the purpose of showing you that is to demonstrate how Vepl is performing because we want to share some of those learnings with you. So today, there's only three areas that I can focus on because of time. Um, if you do want to hear more, if you do want to learn more about Vepl or you want to learn more about what we've learned in the process of launching Vepl and the research we've done, really happy to do that on a one to one basis. And um, there's contact details at the end, and the team now would be more than happy to, to chat you through in your challenges. For now, I'm going to move on to focus on what are the three ways to improve your website to create that better user experience and achieve stats like the ones that you've just seen. 
So the first area I'm going to talk about is personalization. So this level of personalization I'm about to touch on is very bespoke to Veppel, but essentially what Veppel does is as the user, you enter into to Veppel and you can filter. So you can say if you're an undergrad, postgrad, international, domestic, what's your course, what, what are you interested in? And what that means is those users only see the content that's really relevant to them. So they don't have to filter things out. They have a really rich experience, which therefore results in some of those stats that you've just seen because it's a really sticky, rich experience. What does that mean for your website? So that's say that's very bespoke to Veppel. Some tips you can take from this is it's about really clear signposts and make it easier for prospective students when they're on your website to find the content that's relevant to them if you can't do, do that filter and paste. And it works. So this is some of the stats that women join in Veppel um, when students and prospective students are personalising their journey. So when they're doing that filter and piece. So 57% are more likely to click onto one of the main call to actions. 106%, sorry, 106% longer is spent on the site per session on average, again, when they're filtering and personalising their journey. They're 30 times more likely to consent to email marketing and the 36 times more likely to click to chat to staff and students. So that's just showing that power of personalization, that power of filtering, the power of making that content really relevant for them based on what they're saying they want. The second area that I'm going to touch on is this sense of space and place. So I'm going to start with Sophie again, who's just going to give her us her view on what was really important to her when she was looking for this perspective university. Stop video. Sorry. I think there was a big difference between the university website that had virtual experiences and the ones that didn't. So often one of the biggest differences was the fact that some of them had videos of the campus and had videos of all the buildings and the other ones didn't and I think if you don't get that sense of what it looks like as a place it's really hard to grasp whether you want to go somewhere um, so I found that really really useful. So that's Sophie. So what does that mean for, again from a Veppel perspective we can back that up in terms of Sophie saying that sense of space and place is really important I want to learn about the city I'm going to I want to understand what the campus is like we're seeing from a Veppel perspective the third most visited, visited section there is student life so what do I mean by student life there's an example here from Queen's University Belfast. So this is Veppel. This is an example from, from a live Veppel client. And on here, within Student Life, we've got a video of life in Belfast. So tell me what it's like. Tell me what the city's like. Let me get a feel for it. We've got a testimonial under there from a student, which, again, just gives a little bit about the city. And then on the left-hand side, there's examples of events and support that the students can expect to enjoy when they arrive in Belfast and arrive at Queen's. So it just starts to give that real sense for space and place. Yeah. Obviously that example's from Veppel, what does it mean for your website? Again, it's about creating content that students can really immerse themselves in to learn about say the city, the campus, what it's like, and start to relate to what it could be like as an experience. The third piece I'm going to talk about now is peer to peer content and dialogue. So you can see at the top there, the first two, um, the top choices from a, um, sorry, I'm saying this wrong around, the third and fourth um, choices there that prospective students said were really important to them when they were looking at a virtual experience, an online experience with that walk around campus, that guided to it, again, that sense, a sense of space and place that I've just been talking about. But the top two was this point around that live Q&A with staff and students that one-to-one -one conversations and we hear time and time again from students how important it is to have that student-led content as well and um, that comes through in a lot of the research that that we do so to help demonstrate that again this is from Veppel this is Manchester Met's um, 
Vepal site. And what I've done here is I've said I'm interested in business management. So as a prospective student, I've come onto this as an undergrad. Business management is my area of choice. And I can see on the right hand side there, I can watch a video that is about meet business and management students. So I start to see people like me that I can relate to that have done a course or are currently doing a course that I'm interested in. To the left centre there, we've got a quote from a graduate who's done this course at this university that I'm interested in. And then to the nav bar on the left, we've got chat to our students. So if you wanted to talk to someone one to one as a prospective student, either about the city, about the university, about the course, then you get that opportunity to really have that one on one interaction. And then to the top left, um, I've just highlighted there the Faculty of Business and Law. You could click through into there and see some 360s and start to explore. So what it starts to do in one place is bring that that real relevant content to those students who want to see people like me. I want to see people like me that I can relate to doing a course that I'm interested in at the university that I think might be on my shortlist just to help them to start to really engage and deepen that relationship um, that Penny's talked about um, in the first half. Now I'm going to play the last video from Sophie. I'm smiling because it's a, it's a little bit of a bristle watch, but, but it's the truth. And again, it's just, it's here to demonstrate how important it is and the key point that, that students really want to hear from the people they're going to be engaging with, whether that's academics, whether that's staff, whether that's students, and it needs to be relevant. You know what I mean, though? Like, oh, when, like a, when, like, a 50 or 5-year-old... Sorry, I'm no, no, still say, recording. Say, you know when, like, say, a 55-year-old guy comes onto the screen, he's like, this is our great university. I'm thinking, I'm not as interested. So that's that's Sophie telling the truth there um, in, in her mind. But as I say, it's a lot of what students say as well, unless it's Brad Pitt, and then we'll, we'll forgive it. Um, but... In summary, so we talked about three things that you could focus on to really help drive up some of the stats that I shared at the start. It's been given in the context of Apple, but it's as relevant to transfer across to your website. So personalization, that was demonstrated through filtering of Apple, but it's around make it really easy for students to find the content that's right for them. Second, that sense of space and place. So that city life, what's the campus like? Let them immerse themselves. And then the third piece, that peer-to-peer -peer content and dialogue. They want to hear and see people like them. They want to be able to see themselves at your university and in the cities and on the courses that you offer. And as a final reminder, this is just the variance that we're seeing at the minute, the very real variants that's right now it's it's real life data it's very timely from four universities versus Vepel and hopefully some of those areas that we've covered today can just help you to improve some of your bounce rates and session durations um, and ultimately maximize your conversion and on that I'll hand over for any Q&A Jen, thank you so much for that. Um, that was really well. Hopefully people found that insightful and teamed up with Penny's uh, thoughts too. I think we can see the whole journey there. And obviously the answer on the website towards the end. Um, this is the Q&A section. So for those of you that haven't found the chat section yet, if you look at the top, it says settings, then you've got attendees, and then it says chat. Click on chat. And then you've within there, you've got the chat option or the Q&A only. So perhaps if you've got any feedback for us, positive or negative, then feel free to drop that in the chat um, in the Q&A section. Please do feel free to uh, ask some questions. Does anyone want to know? Tap into Penny. She's a font of knowledge when it comes to the league. <laughs> or we've got Jen. Jen's got loads of knowledge when it comes to all that rich data that we've got from Bethel. Um, we were quite excited at Revolution Viewing when we started to marry up the average data across those four websites with... Um, with the Vepal data that we're seeing coming through. Uh, really excited about the level of engagement. Okay, uh, I'm gonna kick off the questions then with a question for Penny. Uh, Penny, 
what are some of the more common website leaks that you've identified? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so uh, this will come as no surprise to you, the inquiry capture. Um, you know, I've said before, unless you know who you're talking to, how can you have a deeply personalised relationship? Um, so, you know, making sure that your inventory is accurate. Um, but, you know, uh, things like making sure that people actually do stay on your website for longer than just a, a quick look, you know, there are so many students in my research that they want to know about their course. They really want course specific information. And as you said, they want to know about student life and they want to hear from real students. Um, so, you know, that really needs to be present on there. And as you said, I mean, I've been in charge of some very large university sites and I know that it's often whoever shouts the loudest. So therefore your website uh, um, I used to work at a very large university and the web pages, we had more web pages than we did the amount of staff and students combined in the university. It had just grown into a beast. So therefore, how could you expect a prospective student to find what was going to be really relevant and really resonate with them? You know, I would have an academic saying, um, you know, she absolutely had to have her full CV on on the site. And we did some analysis and we found that in the last 12 months, two people had visited that page. But she, you know, said to me, those two people were extremely important, Penny. <laughs> you know, th those two people could have meant, you know, a big bid or, you know, and that's who we're, that's who university stakeholders are competing with all of the time when they develop their websites. Um, other things that are relevant, um, scholarships, you know, scholarships are so important to university students, but tend to be all over the shop on websites. Sure. Um, so, you know, just bringing in together all of that relevant material in one place can only cement the relationship. Brilliant. That's really helpful. Thanks, Penny. At the start of, the, um, of your response, you touched on the, the importance of of student-led content and we've seen that uh, ourselves at Revolution Viewing through the research we've done over the years but actually a more recent pilot study that myself and colleagues undertook and um, some of the extracts of those that pilot study were the Sophie videos we've got other videos as well and it was quite amazing the number of um, the reaction sorry when we were comparing different pieces of content and these uh, perspective or these students in this case saw student-led content, a tour of a campus, et cetera, their eyes lit up and they were clearly engaged and uh, found that so much more useful than say some of the other content that was like, that was perhaps uh, not student-led. So I think that's just a big eye opener for, for us all, I think. You can see we have a question here from Dan Arable. Hey Dan, hope you're well. Um, what are the major challenges you think universities are going to face with open days now that students are returning to campus, but also expecting virtual <laughs> options. Good question, Dan. I am going to put that initially to Jen, but then uh, then over to Penny afterwards. So Jen, what's your view on this? So I think it's, it's a really good question. And it's one that clients have been talking about is physical open days, come back, what's that role of online and how, how, do, how does it all work together? Um, and I think you, I think you're right. And I think your question alludes to the fact that students expect it to be something virtually and it's got a real role to play pre and post. So in terms of pre, I've touched on it quite a lot in terms of that shortlisting um, perspective and looking at different universities and Sophie touched on it right at the start of getting from 20 universities to 10 and just getting a feel for what universities might be, might be right for them. I think post, and this is where the two really come in together, that imagine as a student, you've gone to three or four physical open days, you come back and it's all a bit of a blur. The university that stands out is likely to be the university that when you come back, you can go back online and it's really clear. Oh, that's that's the that's the accommodation I saw. That's the lecture theatre I saw. That's the academic that I, I really wanted to get to ask that question but I couldn't but are they doing a talk I can I can talk to them I can engage with them and bring in that pulse piece together so that prospective student can still visit online but almost take it at their own pace as well which is some of the feedback we've had that physical open days are absolutely great 
and they absolutely have a role and there's nothing quite like it but it's very much on the terms of the university i want to explore my own time and my own right and i want to have a look around that 360 and just dig about a little bit more so i absolutely think the two work hand in hand and um, it's very much that pre that physical and that post and that full journey journey through Brilliant. That's really helpful, Jen. Thank you. Or at least I hope, uh, hope Dan felt that. <laughs> Penny, is there anything you'd wish to add to that? Yeah. So there are there are two leaks in the hose pipe that uh, look at open days, and uh, most institutions are really leaky in this. So number one is getting your bookings to actually attend, physically attend. So it's a massive leak for many universities. Um, so you can kind of see that the virtual could still offer something to those non-attenders they they you know they gave something to you by making the book in but they didn't attend but that doesn't mean that all is not lost and wouldn't it be great if there was a, a credible plan b that you could offer them in a virtual open day and the second one is you know there's a big myth in the sector that if we could just get students for our open day they will convert penny they will convert and actually most of my work through the leaky hose pipe has shown that that is indeed a myth um, because you know just getting them onto campus is not enough if your academic sessions are lackluster uh, or boring uh, they can actually turn people off you know and an open day can be an anti-converter um, so I can't help but think that virtual open days could m make something different you know you you have these one hour sometimes terribly boring lecture lectures by people who are good at lecturing but maybe not great at giving that soft sales pitch but could do a really credible five minutes online with a real punch and dyna dynamism um so i would hate for online open days to go because i think they plug a real leak for universities really helpful thanks, dan. yeah thanks dan Thank good you. question there um jen i've got a question for you uh sure. You've used Veppel as a model to highlight how universities can up their online game for prospective students. How can Veppel help during clearing? Sure. So we actually talked about this quite a lot in our last, last webinar, and I think it clearing everything we talk about is even more prevalent. So put yourself in the shoes of a prospective student. I might be having to pick my university where I'm going to spend the next three years and I've never even set foot on campus. I need to find all of that content and information that I want in one place really quickly, really easily, because I'm really stressed. I'm under pressure. I feel like I just need to make a really quick decision. If I can't find that, that's heightened and I'm much more likely just to leave. Whereas if it's all together, I can see again the accommodation a sense of the city i can talk to other students that's so important i i feel like i haven't got any time i just need someone to tell me this is the right decision that's that's appear that understands what i'm going through i want to know what the city's like i want to know what the course is like having to find that all individually say against the pressure of clearing just heightens it so i absolutely think at the the time of clearing that Jen, I think we've lost, uh, I think you're on mute there. Oh, was it on mute yeah, for, for all of that? The time, you get, oh. the time of spring, you oh. your crescendo of fish. Oh, the that's never happened before. It magically did it itself. Wow, I've managed two years in COVID without that happening. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so at the time of clearing, I think it absolutely heightens it. And I think the absolute importance of having content for prospective students in one place that delivers what they need but that ability to talk to other students to see the students that student-led content but explore campus explore cities absolutely paramount brilliant thank you jen uh and final question um for penny um penny Myself and I'm sure the attendees uh, watched your your presentation piece uh, with great interest uh, when, as you talked with Leaky Host Pipe. Um, I just wondered, can you tell me or tell us uh, when you work with clients, like typically what's the process um, of working with those clients? Uh, yeah, um, so um, we start with a data discovery call with UCAS um, just to find out if um, 
but we have sufficient data to look at. So we ask for five data sets. One is inquiries, one is enrollers, open days. Um, and often universities are a bit embarrassed because they say, mm, it's a bit patchy, our data's patchy. But actually all you really need is a first name, a last name and an email. And UCAS can generally match most things. So, you know, don't panic. And, you know, if you feel like your CRM system isn't really, you know, up to much, in a way, that's great that you're doing the work and that you can diagnose the problem and see what you really need from a CRM system. Um, so, yeah, from then on, uh, once the data is submitted, four to six weeks and you get your personalised leaky hose pipe report. Um, it's 40 pages long and so far so good. Everybody who's um, had a leaky hose pipe has loved it. Brilliant. Thank you, Penny. And if someone wanted one of these reports or this uh, piece of consultancy from you, <laughs> um, how would you, how would they contact you? Just a final plug for Penny here. Thank you, Tom. Uh, just <laughs> drop me an email, penny at pennyeccles.co.uk or contact UCAS Media, your relevant account manager at UCAS Media. Fantastic. And, uh, and it wouldn't be me if I didn't give myself and Revolution <laughs> a final big old plug. Guys, if you found uh, this interesting today and if you've enjoyed the, the VEPL element then, uh, and you'd like to understand more about our virtual experience platform and prospective student hub, then please do uh, drop an email to either Jen or myself or send an email to hello at revolutionviewing.com and we'd be delighted to have a bit of a further chat. That could just be a 15-minute chat or right up to a one-hour demo or whatever suits your needs. And so I think at this point, I will bring this webinar to a close with a big thank you Penny, thank you so much uh, for your contributions today. Thank you, Jen, for your contributions. Uh, hopefully, you guys, thank you very much for all attending, all of you. Uh, hopefully, you got something from that. We will be doing another webinar next month. You cannot stop us. We just love talking <laughs> HE and we love helping you guys. Thanks a lot. And thank you for those that start at uh, the very start. Thank you for sharing some of your musical interests and tastes. Um, great to see that we've got some stone roses on the call today. All right, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Take guys. Care. Take Again. care. Bye-bye. See ya, bye. bye. bye.